If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there are many great theologians and Bible teachers um, and uh, many great preachers of the Word. And uh, many of them teach us that we ought to read more. You hang around them, you listen to their sermons, and uh, you think, gosh, I need to read as much as these guys have read. But uh, the guy who's with us tonight is a bit different. He reminds me of the story of the woman who went to her pastor in the 17th century and said, Pastor, how does thee spend thy day? The pastor said, I spend three hours reading the works of the early church fathers, four hours reading the Bible, two hours in prayer, one hour translating Hebrew, another hour translating Greek, and then two more hours in prayer and one more hour of Bible reading before retiring. She said, Pastor, when does thee think? <laughs> thing about uh, <laughs> thing about John Riesinger is that uh, he always teaches us to think. He's a man who thinks. He thinks about what he reads in the Word. He's a man who treats every book of theology, no matter how venerable and no matter who it's written by, as something that is not the Bible. And if it doesn't square with the Bible, it is sola scriptura for John. He will reject anything that he cannot find supported in the Word of God. And 
as a result, uh, I would, I think it is fair to say that he has been responsible for teaching nearly a whole generation of new Calvinist preachers how to think. It's an honor to have him with us tonight. He's going to uh, begin in a moment telling you about a uh, newspaper that he now publishes and uh, a new booklet that he's now written. And I'm just going to let him work that into his greetings and presentation. So let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Gracious God and Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the great blessing that you have given us in not only redeeming us, but in that redemption, calling us into fellowship with one another, into the family of God. We thank you, Lord God, that we are sons and daughters now, having received the spirit of adoption, and that that means that we have family members. We thank you, Lord God, for this brother in the faith who is always teaching us about you as our Father and about the Lord Jesus Christ as our elder brother and all that you have done for us. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would be with him tonight. We thank you, Lord, for his ministry to your saints in all parts of this nation. And we thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of hearing him tonight. We pray that you would use him. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit would be mighty upon him. And we pray, Father, that we might not learn a part from your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I heard a story of a Puritan who had an elderly lady in his congregation who read the scripture diligently. And so one day he took a commentary to her and she didn't know what a commentary was. And so she, he loaned it to her, and about a month later, she thanked him, and she says, I really enjoyed that book you gave me. And she says, it is amazing how the Bible helps me to understand the book. <laughs> and I think sometimes it's amazing how the Bible helps us to understand the writings of men. This is a paper that uh, I have started to edit. We edited it for 10 years. The sword and trowel and then it ceased and this is the same format the same paper we usually have one of charles Haddon spurgeon's sermons and then usually an editorial by myself it is seven dollars a year for ten uh, months and this is a book that uh, was first appeared in this and then was put in book and form it's the sovereignty of god and providence and it covers six principles that run through the scriptures they really give the foundation for understanding all of the scriptures. And they're basic to understanding not just the scriptures, but the life uh, in which we live, especially in 20th century society. The first principle is God has a plan. Secondly, God's always in control. And three, God is uh, always using everybody to work out his plan. He even uses the devil to accomplish his own purposes. And in the end, everything will bring glory to God. And then the fifth principle is that even though the devil is the agent of evil, yet God even controls that for our good. And then the last thing is learning to separate when we have affliction in our life as chastisement for sin and when we have affliction in our life which is not chastisement for sin because all chastisement is not affliction for sin, as in the case of Job and so on. So uh, it's uh, worth reading. It's uh, helped a lot of people. It's an accumulation of 20 years of talking about the same subject and having a discussion. If you subscribe to the paper while I'm here, you get the copy of the book free, and who could possibly resist a deal like that? <laughs> now tonight, this is supposed to be a Bible study, so we hope that you will uh, contribute to it. And instead of having, uh, going through the lesson and then having a uh, uh, discussion period, as we go along, if you have a question, stick up your hand, or if you have a contribution to make, why, just stick up your hand and we'll stop right there. And I do hope that you'll ask questions, because uh, the only dumb question uh, that you can ask 
or the, the only dumb question there is is the one you have and don't ask. That's a really dumb question. <laughs> because if you have a question and you don't ask it, your mind sticks right there. And you have a tendency not to hear anything else. So please, if we say something that you don't understand, then speak up. The book of uh, Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> and we're going to read the uh, first uh, nine verses. Uh, and uh, how many here have a King James? Let me see your hand. Way up high. How many have a NIV? Let me see your hand. Okay. How many have an NASV? All right. The NIV seems to be more popular than the King James. I have both. I have a parallel King James on one side and the NIV on the other side. I use the one where people have the most. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And as we read through this, you kind of make a mental note of anything that jumps out and grabs your attention or something that would lead you to ask a question now, not something that you want me to answer the question but something that really sticks in your mind uh, verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4 therefore my brothers you whom I love and long for my joy and crown this is how you should stand firm in the Lord dear friends I plead with Yodia, and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, as we went through, there was any particular thing that grabbed your attention quickly? Anybody? What was it? Do I look like? <laughs> you look like you had a question in your mind. Um, I just, I wonder what Udia's and Syntyche's disagreement was, what their struggle was with. Okay. You would wonder, you would read that, and you'd say, here's two ladies who aren't getting along with each other. You'd like to know what it was. The Bible doesn't tell us what it was. But it is amazing that Paul would say, in a congregation, because letters were written, and then the elder would get up and read the letter in the congregation. So imagine the elder getting up and saying, uh, these two ladies that were fighting with each other, I wish they would get reconciled to each other. Paul does acknowledge that they are Christians, but they are having problems with each other. Uh, anything else, quickly? All right. One of the things that strikes me as I read it is, uh, not just here, but in the New Testament, the stress that's put on relationships. The relationship of husbands and wives, the relationship of uh, employees to each other, and the, the whole emphasis in many passages of Scripture is the, the method of learning how to walk in the power of the grace of God to enhance our relationships so that we glorify God in them. It's only possible to have uh, a relationship with a person, no matter whether it's a husband or wife or children or employer or anybody else, on one of three bases. We, we either have a relationship where, where I'm the boss and you please me and you become my slave and the relationship is on my terms and that doesn't work very well. Or the relationship is reversed where you dictate the terms and you lay out what has to be done and I'm more or less your slave and the relationship is based entirely on your terms. But the only way a relationship can really bring glory to God and really be good for us is if we say our relationship is gonna be based on the rules of Jesus Christ. Our our relationship is going to be such that the goal of this relationship is going to be to honor our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way relationships ought to be based. Now, uh, the Christian life in the New Testament, without
question is more relational than it is preceptual, although it has precepts. And we have written laws, we have objective standards, but the emphasis is on the relationship with a person and our relationship to each other. We have the duties of husbands and the wives, but when you start talking about duty, it's, it's not so much a law as it is a responsibility. This is what you should do as a person. This is what you should be as a person. And the same thing is true of the uh, wives and their relationship and the husbands and their relationship and fathers and children. Sometimes parents, they say, well, the child is to be the parent's servant. Is that right? Is it? Or is the parent, in a sense, the child's servant? The child doesn't get up and fix you breakfast. The child doesn't do the washing. And although we are the parent and we are the boss, that idea of being boss is, is a lot of that is responsibility of care and love and affection and suffering and everything else. And that's the emphasis in the New Testament. It talks about leadership and it talks about authority. It is more responsibility than it is the idea of a dictator or somebody who goes around with a club. Now the thing that determines relationships and the thing that determines your attitude to another person is your attitude towards yourself. <coughs> now, I don't know if you realize this, but this is a biblical fact. Your attitude to yourself determines your attitude towards other people. Now, right away, when you use a phrase like that, when you start talking about esteem and self-esteem, we've got to be very careful. If you go into any secular bookstore or any Christian bookstore, you will find books on self-esteem by the dozens. Most of them are garbage. Most of them are really not biblical. For instance, we are constantly told to love ourselves. People don't have any trouble loving themselves and they don't have to be told to love themselves. They love themselves too much and they love themselves totally in the wrong way. Somebody told me the other day that the first sermon that was ever preached on American soil by an elder on the Mayflower was on the danger of self-love. Somebody got a copy of it and wrote it to a guy who was a preacher out on the West Coast who preaches nothing but self-love and self-esteem, and they said, perhaps you'd be interested to know that the first sermon in the United States totally contradicts what you preach. And the guy sent him a copy of one of his books on self-esteem. Well, <laughs> When we talk about self-esteem, we are talking about biblical self-esteem. I want you to go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and here is the Pauline doctrine of self-esteem, or how we should look at ourselves. Galatians, chapter 5, beginning to, uh, to read at verse 24, and Paul has just covered the fruits of the Spirit and, and the uh, works of the flesh, and then he says in verse 24 of Galatians 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus, those who are Christians, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Now, I'm sure that you all have learned enough Greek to know what the aorist tense is. I don't know much Greek, but I know a little Greek. He has a sub shop up in Carlisle. I know a little Hebrew. He has a tailor shop. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what the aorist tense is in the Greek language? When the Bible uses the aorist tense, what is it trying to emphasize? It's a past action. It's a past action. And what else? It's a finished action. In other words, the aorist tense is boom. It happened. It isn't going to happen again. It isn't going to get bigger. It isn't going to get smaller. It's a once for all completed action. It's the verb which is used in justification. Therefore, having been once for all justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you have come to faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you were just as justified in the sight of God the moment you trust in Jesus Christ as you will be the day that you die. The day that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you were just as justified as the Apostle Paul was when he was at the height of his Christian experience. Justification never gets smaller, 
never gets bigger. Nobody's more justified than somebody else, and you don't get it twice. Justification is once for all. Boom, it happened. Now, in this verse, this is aorist tense. They who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature that is aorist. It happened once for all. The other thing about this phrase is it is in the active voice. Now, when something is in the active voice, it means we are the ones who did the acting. It was our will, it was our mind, it was our action. We did it. In the passive voice, that means that we are acted upon. Somebody else is acting, and we are not active in it. Now, this is active. They who belong to Christ, or they who are Christians, they did something. And they did it once for all. And what did they do once for all? They crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. Now, this text is not to be confused with Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, it says, we have been crucified with Christ. What's the obvious difference in the two verses? One is passive and the other one is active. If you're a Christian here tonight, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ in his own body bare your guilt and your sin. Your sin and your guilt was put on him, and you were, in the mind and purpose of God, crucified with Christ. And your guilt was put on him. That was something he did. You were totally passive in this. This is not something that you were active in. You and your whole life, with his guilt and shame, was crucified with Christ when he died on the cross. He was treated the way you deserve to be treated, that you might be treated the way he deserved to be treated. That great text in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He collected the wages that our sin earned, and we collect as a free gift the wages that his sinless life earned. And his sinless life earned righteousness. We collect the wages of righteousness. God treats us as if we were as righteous as Christ. He collected the wages that we earned, sin and death. Now, we were crucified with Christ. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something that we did. And if you're a Christian, you did this. And if you didn't do this, you're not a Christian. What did it say? They who belong to Christ, they who are Christians, they have crucified the flesh with a sinful nature, with its passions and desires. What does that mean? What does that mean? When you did that, what did it mean to you? It you're no longer enslaved by the desires of the flesh. No longer enslaved by the desires of the flesh. Ah, uh, all right. But what did you do to to come to that position? Change your mind. You were brought by the grace of God and the Spirit of God to change your mind, and you made a very decisive decision. Before you were a Christian, you thought you were hot stuff. In fact, you were number one. Is that right? You were not at war with sin, and you did not think sin was an enemy, and you did not fight with sin. I didn't fight with sin before I was a Christian. Why should I fight with my lover? <laughs> Is that right? We went looking for sin. Is that right? We said, here I am, man, let's go. But when you came under conviction, you came to repentance and all this verse is talking about is he used the phrase change of mind which is what repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of attitude and a change of direction and habit and everything else but all he's saying is when you became a christian you repented you viewed yourself before that as worthy of praise and respect and honor and admiration and God ought to reward you for being so great but when you repented what you said was there wasn't anything worth saving and God ought to destroy the whole thing you said you deserved to perish when you came to repentance and you said sin is an enemy 
And there isn't anything about it that ought to be saved. There's nothing about me that ought to be saved. You crucified the sinful nature and its lust and its passion. That's another way of saying those who belong to Christ Jesus have repented. Now, the Christian life is nothing but daily renewing that repentance and reminding ourselves of who we were before God saved us, how God saved us, and what we owe to God because he saved us. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, the sinful nature, with its passions and lust. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Now, that's another way of saying, since we're Christians, since we've been born of the Spirit, since we've been given spiritual life, since we've passed from death and sin to life in the Spirit, since we've been born of God, let's prove it by the way we live. If we have spiritual life, let's keep in step with the Spirit, or let's follow the truth, let's obey the Word, let's prove that we're Christians. Verse 26 is the verse we want to get to. Here's what we're not supposed to do. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now, what's a conceited person like? What's the problem with a conceited person? Hmm? Too much self-love. Too much self-love. I like that. All right. What's the mark of a conceited person? They're insecure. They um, compare themselves to other people and find fault with themselves. They some anger. They feel like they have to compete with other people. And that's where all the envy and striving comes from. That's where, the, that's where the envying and the striving comes from. Yeah. A conceited person thinks something about himself which is not true. He has wrong thoughts about himself. And the scripture tells us we're to think right thoughts about ourselves. We're to have a right attitude towards ourselves. And if we don't have a right attitude towards ourselves, we can never have a right attitude towards other people. So he says, let's not be vain glory. Let's not think we're something we're not. Well, let's think about a Christian for a moment. What is a Christian? And how should a Christian think about himself? Well, first of all, if he came to repentance, he acknowledged he was nothing. He acknowledged he deserved to go to hell. You cannot believe in total depravity and never be proud. You cannot believe in total depravity and never look down your nose at somebody else. When you think you're better than somebody else and you deserve something better than what you're getting, you've lost the truth of depravity, and you're conceited. You know what you and I deserve? To go to hell humbly. <laughs> yeah. If you're out of hell, you've already got more than you deserve. Is that right? Now, we got to remind ourselves, because that's what we acknowledge when we came to Christ. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Let's not be vainglorious. And one of the things that helps you to keep from becoming vainglorious is reminding yourself of what you were without Jesus Christ. But dare a Christian ever stop there? See, this is the danger of what one of my friends calls worm theology, <laughs> where, where we're told we're worms. And see, I'm not a worm. I was. <laughs> when the Lord found me, I was a maggot. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the word means when it says, the, the text really means maggot. That's really what it means. We, we said, uh, they changed that hymn, would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? They changed that to such a one as I. But the Hebrew word means, literally, maggot. Now, are we maggots in God's sight tonight if we're Christians? What are we? Children. Sons of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, indwelt by His Spirit. So th these two things must go together. We dare not ever forget we started off in the dunghill. We started off to pray. We acknowledge that in our repentance. But if we've been born of God's Spirit, we're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Nobody is better than me in Christ. Nobody's more in Christ than I am. 
I am no better than anybody else because of the property. I can't look down my nose at anybody. But you know something? I can't look up at anybody either and envy them. Is that right? Now notice how Paul puts this. Let's not be conceited. Let's not have wrong thoughts about ourselves. Why? Because if we have a wrong thought about ourselves, what will be our attitude and relationship to the other person? We will either provoke or we will envy. Now, if we think that we are better than somebody else, what are we going to do? We're going to provoke them. We're going to challenge them. Man, what's the use of being number one if you can't prove it? I mean, that's the best part of being number one. That's the best part of being better. Somebody is showing them up. And you will, if you, if you feel that you're better than somebody, you will find a way to challenge them, whether it's in an argument or whether it's to a game or whether it's the way you dress or something, but you will try to prove that you're better than they are. I love to play golf. And I'm a pretty fair golfer. I caddied when I was a kid. And I, I play pretty good golf. I only play in the 70s. If it gets any warmer than that, I don't play. <laughs> uh, I, I see it in the high 70s or the low 80s when I play golf regularly. Now, some of you know Gary Scott. He's a preacher. And Gary is not too good a golfer. But he is a competitor. I mean, he is a competitor. And he would give his right arm to beat me in golf, and he'll never do it. <laughs> because he, he, he never learned the basics of the game. And I love to play golf with Gary. Now, he also plays ping pong. And I play ping pong. And I used to think I was fairly good till I played him. And I've never beaten him once. And I don't like to play ping pong. <laughs> now, you see, we will provoke and challenge the person that we think we're better than they are. And what do we do with the person that we think they are better than we are? We envy them. And when you, you envy the person that you will either talk about it behind his back or you will do something to, to try to bring him down a peg. You see what Paul is saying? You cannot love and serve a person if you don't have the right attitude towards yourself. No husband can love and serve his wife if he thinks his wife is either below him or above him. You can't love and serve a woman when you believe you deserve somebody better. It's impossible. You also can't serve and love a woman that you're afraid of and try to buy her affection. It's impossible. And likewise, no woman. A woman can't serve her husband and love her husband in a biblical sense when she believes she deserves somebody a whole lot better than him. It's impossible. You may serve through grit of teeth, but in the end, it will erupt someday and be worse off in the end than it was at the beginning. In other words, your attitude towards yourself determines your attitude to other people. And what determines your attitude to yourself? Your attitude in relationship to God. Your attitude towards God as the creator and the lawgiver and the judge and the redeemer is the thing that determines who you are in your own eyes. When you lose the Bible as the Word of God, then the next thing you lose is the God of the Bible, who is the Creator. And the moment you lose the creatorship of God, you know who else you lose? You lose yourself. Modern psychology has taught us that we, we know ourselves to a large degree as we know the environment out of which we came. And that's true. You, you really know a lot about yourself when you carefully look at the environment out of which you came. Now, all of us come out of the same mold in one sense. Some are a lot older than others. But <laughs> <laughs> it's also true that we come out of different molds, and our environment shapes us. And learning our background and where we came helps us understand ourselves. Now, that's a million times more true spiritually. You only know who you are as you know who God, the Creator, the Lawgiver, and the Judge is. And that's why our society is so, so very, very lost. That's why people feel like they're only a number. That's why people say, what's the name of the game? Where is it at? And they're trying to find reality, and they believe they have to make their own reality. 
and women will walk out of a relationship, walk out of on children. Husbands will do the same thing to find themselves, to be true to themselves. That's utter garbage. They've lost who God is, and then they've lost who they are, and then they've lost all responsibility to God as their creator, their lawgiver, their judge, and their redeemer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know ourselves only as we know God, and only as we have a right attitude towards Him will we ever have a right attitude toward our fellow man in all of our relationships. I was teaching at a university, not the, I was teaching at the university, but I had a group of university kids for a weekend retreat up in Montreal, Canada, with InterVarsity. And there was one boy that was very hostile. And he would use God's name in vain just to get a rise out of me. And he didn't believe anything I said. If I'd quote a verse of scripture, he'd say, don't give me that sentimental goo. I want facts. This was when rationalism used to be king. You see, you go in a circle history. You have rationalism and then you have romanticism. When I was in university 35 years ago, my, that's a long time, isn't it? 35 years ago, rationalism was king of the campus. Everybody asked, why? Prove it. If you could prove something, somebody would believe it. If we could have gotten in Bucknell University in the early 50s, if we could have gotten an internationally known scientist to come and lecture on why he believed the Bible was the word of God, half of the students on the campus would have come to listen to him because they were interested in proving rationalism was king. If we would have gotten an Indian guru with spit running down his beard to play a guitar and chant, you'd have had two homosexuals and a couple kooks would have gone to hear him. He'd have been run off the campus. Now it's the exact opposite because romanticism is king. And now you don't think with your head, you think with your heart. The question now is not, is it true, but does it turn you on? That's the important thing. And you see it in art, you see it in music, you see it in everything. Well, back then, uh, um, romanticism hadn't made the swing yet, and the guy was logical. He wanted a logical, rational answer. So I was standing in front of a blackboard, and we were getting no place. So I wrote the word G-O-D, God, on the board. And I said, what's that mean to you? He says, not a blank, blank thing. And he swore. And I said, you don't believe in any God? He said, no. So I put no in front of it, no God. And I said, you don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth? He says, no. So I put no creator. And I said, well, how do you explain yourself in the universe and everything? Evolution, so I put on the board evolution. And I said, how does evolution work? What controls it? What's, what's guided it to the place that it's produced us? And he said, survival of the fittest, so I put that on the board. No God, no creator, evolution, survival of the fittest. And I changed the subject. And about a half hour later, I said to him, not, his name was Harry. I said, Harry, I bet you think that I ought to treat as my equal somebody who only went to fourth grade in school, who's on the third generation of relief. Maybe he's of a minority culture. Maybe he's black. And you think I ought to treat him as my equal. He got mad. He gritted his teeth. He swore. He called me a racist. He called me a bigot. And he was mad. And I said, Harry, I'm asking you for a rational reason why I should treat him as my equal. I don't want your sentimental goo. I don't want your liberal nonsense. I want you to give me a logical, rational answer. He got mad. I said, you're being emotional. He cursed. <laughs> I kept pushing him. And you know what he finally blurted out? And I knew I could push him there because you're both created equal in the sight of God. <laughs> I said, no, Harry, we settled that 20 minutes ago, you remember? And I turned around, no God, no creator, evolution, survival of the fittest. I said, man, I'm a lot more fit than he is. That joker used up 40% of my tax dollar. I went to college, he only went to four. You know what, I, th I think we ought to shoot everybody on relief. Shoot all the cripples. And just think what a kind of a society we'd have. 
we'd have a super race. Is that right? And I said, Harry, do you know anybody ever tried that? <laughs> you know anybody put that philosophy to work? And man, he knew I had it. You know why Hitler did what he did? Because he believed in no God, no creator, evolution, survival of the fittest. You know what communism is? It's nothing but political evolution. It's evolution using, I mean, it's politics using the theory of evolution. I know I shouldn't do it. I get, I, I get mean sometimes. I don't mean to be honest. I'm sweet, but, but everyone's fine. And I turned to Harry, I said, Harry, it's guys like you that are causing all the problems. I said, I have to treat that black boy, or that red boy, or that yellow girl, whatever their color is, whatever their background is, whatever their needs are. They are my equal before God and before law. Is that right? Why? Because God created us equal. But do away with God. Do away with Creator. Then why shouldn't I get a hold of everything I can get a hold of and use anybody I can use to get a hold of it? Brother, if there's a judge that I've got to give an account to, then you have a moral basis. I said, you see, here you are. You tell me that my beliefs in God and the creatorship of God, all that's baloney. That's all phony money. But then when you want to go out into the real life and the blood and guts of reality and you want to buy justice and love and equality, you want to use my phony money to do it. Is that right? Yeah. You see, you don't treat your fellow man wrong until you first have a wrong relationship with God. You remember the book of Romans, it says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now Paul's not saying the same thing twice. Ungodliness is our view of God. And it manifests itself in idolatry. Unrighteousness is our attitude to other people. You cannot possibly believe that another person is made in the image of God and not have a compassion for that person. Is that right? Yes, sir. And our society has lost the creatorship of God. And that's why there's the hate. That's why there's the greed. That's why there's everything that goes with it. Yes, we have a question. Yeah. This person is talking about using evolution have a rude awakening someday. Yeah, there will be because you when, believe the lie. Stand, when he stands before the church seat of his maker. Yeah. He will have a rude awakening for, for this reason. First of all, in the book of Romans chapter 1, uh -huh. Paul's whole argument is that the man who doesn't believe in God the Creator is rejecting all of the evidence that's there. And in his heart of hearts, he knows better. You could take the, the, the most brilliant philosopher and take him up on the top of Pike's heat peak some night when the moon is full and the stars are bright and there's not a cloud in the sky and let him say out loud so his own voice hears him. There's nobody there. It's all an accident. Yeah. He can't do it. He knows better. See, the book of Romans and the book of Psalms teaches us that God's creation screams at man. And God's creation says, I'm here, I'm God, I'm great, I'm glorious, I made you. And right. man has to put his fingers in his ears and run away from that. And when he runs away from that, then he can't respect God's creation. He can't love his fellow man. All he can do is be interested in himself. I believe we must treat people as our equal. Because there is a creator. I believe we must have sympathy and compassion. And whatever we have, we use it for the glory of God. That's right. Somebody said there's very little difference between communism and Christianity. The only difference is this. The communist says what's yours is mine, I'm going to take it. And the Christian says what's mine is yours, I'm going to share it. Not much difference, is there? <laughs> uh, now, can you see where your attitude to God and your attitude to yourself it affects your attitude to other people. Nobody could possibly understand depravity and the grace of God and ever be a racist. It'd be impossible. A racist doesn't believe in depravity. But the moment you and I assent to depravity, then we cannot be envious of anybody, we cannot look down at anybody. And the other thing is, 
once we understand the sovereign electing grace of God, then what do we say? I am what I am by the grace of God. Is that right? No matter who we are, what we are, how do we get that way? The grace of God. So you start off, you confess your depravity. You deserve nothing but condemnation. You can't possibly be proud. You can't look down your nose at anybody. And then on the other hand, I am what I am by the grace of God. Well, who can I envy if God is my Father and He's given me everything that I need to glorify Him? How can I be envious? Am I really not saying that God isn't as good as He says He is? You see how theology is so important? You see how your self-image is tied up, not with loving yourself, but loving God and acknowledging His sovereign grace and acknowledging your nothingness. But then don't stop there. See, John Newton had it right when he said, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." We have preachers today that don't want to preach about law. They don't want to preach about duty. They don't want to preach about the holiness of God. And if we don't preach that, nobody's ever going to fear to the place that they're afraid of hell. But Newton didn't stop there. Twas grace, my, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. And the most gracious thing God can do is press his law on our conscience and make us feel our sin. But that fear, grace, relief, is that right? It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace that fear relieved. And if the fear of God, in the right sense, pushes us to Christ, and sees in Him the one who bear our sin and our guilt and our shame, then we ask ourselves, well, why would He love me so much? Why would Christ die for me? You want to feel important? You want to feel really important? Stand under the cross and realize that the Son of God sacrificed Himself just to save a sinner like you. You see, we 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 value a thing by how much it costs. Is that right? Everybody says, how much it costs? How much it costs? And you value a thing by its cost. What's the most valuable thing in all the world? Well, what costs the most to buy? A sinner like you. Is that right? A sinner like you. The death of Jesus Christ was the price that God paid to bring us to himself. And so Paul says, man, don't be vainglorious. Don't be conceited. And when you stand under the cross and realize your depravity, and you realize the electing grace of God, you can't be vainglorious. You can't be conceited. And if you aren't conceited, it's impossible to provoke. you got nothing to provoke about nor is it possible to be envious. You see, an inferiority complex is just as bad as a superiority complex for a true Christian. Now, in practical life, there are people who have real problems with self-esteem. And that's because we've mixed up all of the roles that God gave. Men and women, husbands and wives. Did God make men and women different? Yes, he did. And did he give them different roles? In no sense is a man better than a woman. By the way, it doesn't say women be subject to men. It says husbands be subject to your wives be subject to your own wives. The only time that a husband was told to be in subjection to his wife was in Abraham. You remember Abraham? God said to his wife, you listen to Sarah. She knows what she's talking about. And she was right, even though... She's the one who got him in trouble in the first place. She's also the one who got him out of trouble. <laughs> but anyhow, here you have husbands and wives, and here God made man to be the leader. And he made the woman to be nurtured and loved and cared for. But then along comes sin. And you see, sin twists this. And man will take the God-given directives and commandments and he'll use it out of his selfishness to try to make a woman a slave. And he will, because he misunderstands what God commanded him to do. And some men are tyrants, and they think that that, that means that, that a woman is to obey their every wish just because they're a man. That's nonsense. What does the woman do? The woman takes the commandment of God 
and the purpose of God to nurture and love. And she uses this to control the man. If you really love me, you would do that and so and so on and so on. So here are two people made for each other. Both of them, because of their selfishness, their sin, instead of fulfilling the role that God gave them and submitting to that role, they try to use that very thing to dominate the other one. And you have a contest of who's going to be the boss. As they both learned this principle in Galatians, and they learned the basis of a right relationship. Now, there's two fears that plague all men, whether they're Christians or non-Christians. By the way, I forgot to look what time it was when I started. It's early. Hmm? It's early. It's early. <laughs> <laughs> he said he could edit the tape. That on All right. There are two, two basic fears that undergird everything. One is the unchangeable past, which is a plague in all of us. If only I wouldn't. If only I wouldn't. And the other one is the unpredictable future. And these are the two things that, that, that undergird all other fears and all anxieties. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, these two basic fears are resolved because the unchangeable past is totally forgiven and will never catch up with us. It's gone. And tomorrow <coughs> and eternity is just as secure as the promise of God. Is that right? Now, in our personal experience, in our relationships with each other, and this whole idea of being glorious and provoking and so on. A lot of it grows out of the inability of learning how to forgive. See, when you've been hurt, there has to be forgiveness on your part before there can be healing. And the unchangeable past is the things that we dwell on and the hurts. Maybe it was as a child. Maybe it's from a husband or a wife. Maybe it's from a parent. Maybe it's from work. But we carry all these hurts. And that's the thing that destroys the relationship. Because when we look at the person, we think of the hurt. We think of what they said, we think of what they did, and there it is, it's on them. And if he had hurt me badly, every time I see him, I think of that hurt. And I can't give myself to him, I can't receive his friendship, because there's the hurt. In my heart, as a Christian, I'm commanded to forgive. Now, that doesn't mean I run up to somebody who, who has done something against me and say, I forgive you. If they don't believe they did it, that just makes it worse. You never forgive a person to his face of sin until he repents of that sin. God don't do it with you. We shouldn't do it with other people. This idea we run up and say, I forgive you. No, 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 no. If a person has truly sinned and really sinned, you tell him he sinned. Tell him he should repent. And if he repents, then you freely forgive him. But you still have to be ready to forgive him in your heart. And before God, you have to forgive him, or else you're going to carry the hurt and the grudge inside of you. That's what Paul means when he says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. we got to get that out. You see, what happens is when you don't forgive a person, you're still angry with them. And you carry inside of you an instant replay of that hurt. And when you see them, or you hear a song that associates with that, or go someplace that's associated with that former relationship, the instant replay goes on. And you go over the whole hurt all over again. And the only thing that will shut that instant replay off is forgiveness in your heart before God. Don't ever think that you have to forget in order to forgive. If you can forget something without forgiving it, then you got problems because you've stuffed it down inside of your subconscious and it's going to come back to haunt you. You forgive first and then you're able to start forgetting. But you can't even start to forget until you truly forgive. Now, until we can forgive, that instant replay is there and that will block any good relationship. You know why it's so hard to forgive? Why do you think it's hard to forgive? Why would you think that one of the hardest, why is forgiveness so hard? Pride? Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to admit we're wrong. 
self-defense, yeah. Looks like you have five in the sense that you, have, you hang on to that person hurt me, that person did me wrong, but I'm right not to want a relationship with that person. Yeah, in other words, when you forgive something, you give up the last acts that you have a hold of. See, as long as you feel justified, then you don't have to do your part in the relationship. Well, why should I do that for him? Look what he did to me. He hasn't said he's sorry. But the moment you forgive, then that means that you have to enter back into your responsibility in the relationship. See what I'm saying? And that's what we're afraid of because that makes us vulnerable because now we got no excuse for being what God wants us to be in the relationship. See, when you forgive, what you do is you do deliberate, conscious, selective spiritual surgery. There's always pain involved in forgiveness. And here's, here's somebody hurts you over and over again, maybe. And there it is. And it's right on them. And in forgiveness, you go into your memory and you take that thing and you know they did it. But you say, for Jesus Christ's sake, I'm going to forgive them. And you take that and you take it off of them and you put it over here. And you say, I am not going to let that in any way affect my relationship with them. I'm not going to hold back my love, my affection, or anything else or my part of my responsibility in this relationship. That's forgiveness. But you see, it makes you vulnerable because now you've got to do what you're supposed to do whether the other one does or doesn't. But listen to me, that's the only thing that sets you free. When you learn to forgive, you'll learn to set a prisoner free and discover that you're the prisoner. And sometimes people say to me, but they don't deserve to be forgiven. I just talked last week to a wife who, whose husband left her with three children. And, and, and it was horrible what he did. It was absolutely awful what he did. But she has to forgive him in her heart. And she says, but he doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And you know what I say? You're right. But you deserve to forgive him. Because you're the one who's hurting. You're the one who's getting the ulcers. You're the one who can't sleep. You deserve to forgive him. You deserve to be set free. And forgiveness in our hearts is the thing that sets us free. And sometimes God uses that to bring the other person to repentance. Sometimes he doesn't. We can't manipulate people with forgiveness or anything else. It's entirely up to God and his grace. Now, that's what we do in forgiveness. Now, that's exactly what God did with us. He took our sin, which was before his face, and he took that sin and he put it on Jesus Christ. And he said, my relationship with you and my attitude towards you and my treatment of you is not going to be on the basis of what you did, but on the basis of my love to you and my covenant promise to you. That's forgiveness, and that's what God did with us. Now, the other thing that plagues us, and, and I better say this, you can't change the past. My dear hearts, you can change your relationship to the past. You really can. You do not have to mortgage tomorrow with yesterday. And your own relationship, your own sins, your own failures, they do not disqualify you for tomorrow. They do not ruin the rest of your life. They do not change the promises of God. When there's forgiveness, there's forgiveness with God. And we start off with a new slate. That's amazing to me. That's absolutely amazing to me. But I'm glad it's true. I couldn't sit here tonight and preach to you if I didn't believe in forgiveness. Knowing my heart as I know my heart and knowing that God sees my heart, I couldn't preach if I didn't believe in forgiveness. A husband and wife can't live together if they don't believe in and practice forgiveness. You put two sinners together, even sanctified sinners, in the same house, in the same bedroom, I tell you, buddy, they better learn how to forgive day in and day out. Is that right? Now, you can't change the past, but you can change the hook that the past has in you. And it's effect on you today by the grace of God. Now, the other thing is the unpredictable future. Five minutes? Okay. In the unpredictable future, that is resolved with promise. 
I see our society can't forgive, nor can it promise. Because when you promise, you give yourself. See, when I promise you I'll meet you at 3 o'clock, I'm giving 3 o'clock tomorrow to you. I'm giving myself to you. I'm guaranteeing, as much as in me, your future. Because I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to meet that commitment. And that's why people don't want to promise, because they don't want commitment. I went to a wedding here a while back. Some friends of mine, the daughter, get back. You know what they said in the wedding vows? We promise to remain with each other until our love runs out. <laughs> until our love runs out. Oh, boy. What about? But that's the way most people are. I have people tell me that, that, that I, I can't possibly love my wife if I don't feel like it. What a bunch of baloney. My friend, feeling has nothing to do with forgiveness. Feeling has nothing to do with love. You try that with God. I don't have to love God. I don't feel like it. Until I feel like it, I don't have any responsibility to love it. Try it. See how it works. Baloney, man. <laughs> we always do our duty. I don't know where people get the idea that doing your duty and obeying law is legalism. Legalism is not obeying the law. Legalism is not obeying duty. Legalism is obeying the law and pretending you like it when you hate it. That's, that's legalism. That's hypocrisy. I hate to shave. I hate it. But if I stood there and said, oh, I love to shave, I'd be a hypocrite, through and through. Man, you always do your duty whether you feel like it or not. And pray God to enliven your heart and give you the joy of obedience in the path of duty. But you don't wait for a feeling to do duty. You don't wait for a feeling to love. You don't wait for a feeling to go to church. You don't wait for a feeling to give. You do it because it's your duty. Okay, the unpredictable future is fixed with promise. And God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He gives himself to us. He commits himself to it. And all that he is. And that's the only way we can help another person. And that's what we need to help us. Is promise. The promise of relationship. The promise of love. To be accepted as we are in order to change. You see this idea, you've got to accept me and love me as I am. That's a dangerous thing. That's half right, but it has to be the area of neutrality where I can open my heart and confess what I really need and the help that I need without being fear, without being afraid of being jumped on and rejected. That's an awful feeling. But we don't say, love me as I am, and what we mean is, don't mess with me, because I ain't going to change for nobody. That's sin. We do say, love me as I am, accept me as I am, and help me change. Ah, that's fine. And that's what we need. And we need a relationship that is built on confidence, where we can open our hearts and not be rejected, and learn how to change our relationship to the past, and have hope for the future because we know how to promise and we know how we give know how to give ourselves to a relationship and when we do that we begin to have a right attitude to ourselves and a right attitude to other people we'll be not vain glorious not conceited we won't be provoking we won't be envying we won't be hooked into the past we won't be scared of tomorrow we'll say bless the lord and we'll begin to rejoice Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, rejoice. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Amen. And if you aren't a Christian, you know how to become a Christian. You trust Jesus Christ, and you give yourself to him in repentance and faith, and you ask him to receive you and love you as you are. You ask him to forgive you. Check out our websites, biblequery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. Historycart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. Muslimhope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.
Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the Jesus in